In 1632, Morimoto Ukandayo Kazafusa, a Japanese merchant and traveler, embarked on a pilgrimage to the Temple of Angkor Wat in the Kingdom of Cambodia. Like many other Japanese Buddhists before him, he believed the temple city to be the Jetavana, or the Garden of Buddha, mentioned in Buddhist scriptures and located in present-day Uttar Pradesh, India. This site held great spiritual significance for the Japanese and other Buddhists, and over the years between 1612 and 1632, dozens of pilgrims from cities like Higo, Hizen, Hirado, Nagasaki, Sakai, and Osaka made the journey to Angkor Wat to pay their respects. As a testament to their pilgrimage, 14 inscriptions left by Japanese can still be found on the walls of Angkor Wat today, dating back to the period between 1612 and 1632. Among these, the most well-known is that of Ukondayu Kazufusa, who penned a celebratory message marking the Khmer New Year during his visit to Angkor. The pilgrimages to Angkor Wat reveal an intriguing chapter in Japan's history, when its people displayed a keen interest in lands beyond their borders. This period coincided with significant Japanese activity in Southeast Asia, including its involvement in intra-Asian trade. However, what sets the Japanese presence in Angkor apart is its reflection of a time when the Japanese shogunate cultivated a cordial relationship with the Kingdom of Cambodia. Welcome to Stories in History, where we explore fascinating tales from the past. In this video, we'll delve into the captivating story of Japanese pilgrims to Angkor Wat, Cambodia's first Nihon Machi, and the early diplomatic relationship between Cambodia and Japan in the early 17th century. Thank you for choosing my channel for your historical interests. If you find this video engaging, please consider hitting the like and subscribe button to stay tuned for more captivating stories. Now, without further delay, let's dive into the story of the Japanese in Cambodia. Following Tokugawa Ieyasu's rise to Shogun in 1603, one of his top priorities was establishing a stable framework for international commerce in Japan. This led to the creation of the Shuinjo, or Maritime Pass System, which mandated that all ships departing Japan for trade acquire a special trading license. These licenses, also known as Red Seals, authorized merchants to undertake a single voyage to a specific destination and ensured a friendly welcome in ports throughout Southeast Asia. This system primarily served to allow the shogun to closely monitor Japan's interactions with other nations. In the first year that records survived for the Red Seal ships in 1604, 356 licenses were issued to Japanese-based merchants, with the majority being intended for trade in Southeast Asia. The passengers on these ships included merchants, Christian refugees, and ronin seeking trade, refuge, or work abroad. The phenomenon of Japanese mercenaries and Christian refugees has been explored in a previous video about Thailand's first Nihon Machi, so I won't be delving too deeply into that here. However, one crucial aspect of the Red Seal system's success was its dependence on the Tokugawa shogunate receiving diplomatic recognition from other countries. Between 1601 and 1614, the shogunate and his senior officials dispatched 76 diplomatic letters throughout the world, marking a significant shift in Japan's foreign policy. This was the first time Japan made direct contact with countries beyond China and Korea at the state level, breaking away from the confines of traditional East Asian diplomacy. Many of these letters were sent to Southeast Asian states, including Patani, Nguyen Lord Vietnam, Ayutthaya, the Spanish Philippines, and Cambodia. It is worth noting that these letters were less about forming diplomatic alliances and more about establishing a command that states interested in trade with Japan had to adhere to the Red Seal system and pay tribute accordingly. One of the most important stipulations of these letters was that states would have to refuse entry to their ports to any Japanese merchant without a Red Seal certificate authorizing them to trade outside of Japan. The surge in maritime trade between Japan and Southeast Asia had an unprecedented impact, resulting in the arrival of thousands of Japanese migrants, merchants, and ronin in ports across the region. While Ayutthaya and Spanish Manila were the largest destinations for Japanese, significant numbers also arrived in Cambodia during this time period, not just for pilgrimages to Angkor, but also to trade. In addition, many ronin found employment in Cambodia, serving the king as mercenaries. In 1623, for instance, 
King Songtham of Ayutthaya sent a letter to the shogun revealing that the Cambodian king Che Cheta had hired Ronin to defend against an invasion by Ayutthaya. The letter inquired about the shogun's reaction if any of his subjects were to be harmed during the potential campaign. It's also worth noting that a significant number of Ronin also became privateers harassing merchant ships of the coast of Cambodia and Champa, the most famous one being Yamada Nagamasa, Thailand's famous samurai. By many, this activity was seen as a form of piracy and was a cause of significant tension between Japan and the countries affected by it. During the period from 1601 to 1635, Japanese communities began to form in various cities throughout the Kingdom of Cambodia. The most well-known of these communities was located in a village called Panjalu, which was mentioned in Dutch sources from the time. Panjalu is believed to correspond to present-day Ponilu district, which was part of the old royal capital of Udong, located on the shores of Tonle Sap. While the area was primarily inhabited by Portuguese merchants, it was reported to have a Japanese population of around 100 individuals, many of whom were likely mercenaries hired by the Portuguese or Christian converts fleeing persecution in Japan. There was an estimated 1,500 additional Japanese who lived throughout Cambodia during the time period. Despite generally friendly relationships between Japanese communities and those surrounding them, there were some Japanese who engaged in piracy along the coasts of Cambodia and Champa, causing significant issues for both the Japanese shogun and local rulers. In 1605, King Baram Rechia of Cambodia filed a formal complaint with the shogun in Edo, prompting Tokugawa Ieyasu to respond that while he desired for Japanese merchants to continue traveling to Cambodia yearly for trade, he did not approve of their riotous behavior. He stressed that such actions were intolerable and urged Baram Rechia to ensure that none of the offenders escaped punishment. In a subsequent letter later that year, Ieyasu lamented that Japanese privateers had been tormenting people in Cambodia and advised the king of Cambodia to punish them in whatever manner he deemed appropriate. However, problems persisted and later in 1610 he reiterated that Baram Rachia should not hesitate to execute Japanese merchants who failed to follow the laws of the kingdom. Similar complaints were also lodged by the Nguyen lords in Vietnam who received similar advice to punish Japanese merchants according to local laws. A noteworthy aspect of Tokugawa Ieyasu's response is his apparent lack of willingness to provide any assistance to his subjects abroad or preserve their legal sovereignty. He was content to allow foreign kings, such as Baram Rachia, to punish his subjects according to local laws. Unlike the Dutch and Portuguese, Japanese merchants in Southeast Asia did not have the backing of their home state. Nevertheless, between 1605 and 1632, Japan and Cambodia maintained a friendly and diplomatic relationship as evidenced by their correspondences. The letters exchanged between the two nations revealed that they offered tributes and gifts to each other and sent emissaries to each other's courts frequently. Tokugawa Ieyasu sent regular gifts of Japanese swords, horses, and gold leaf folding screens to Baram Rachia. In return, Cambodia provided gifts of deerskin, peacocks, tiger pelts, and folding fans to the shogun. There was even an instance in 1603 where Tokugawa Ieyasu offered to send reinforcements to aid Baram Rachia against a rebellion in Cambodia. Furthermore, the Japanese shogun requested a favor from Baram Rachia to acquire some agar wood from the Lord of Champa as he could not locate any. The letters written between the Japanese shogun and the Cambodian king suggest that Japan and Cambodia had established a strong diplomatic and cordial relationship in the early 17th century. And it was within the context of this friendly relationship where Japanese pilgrimages to Angkor Wat took place. By the time Okandayu Kazafusa arrived to Angkor Wat, the city had been long since abandoned due to an invasion by Ayutthaya at around 1431, which led to the fall of Cambodia's ancient capital. Ayutthaya's invasion of Cambodia in 1431 only really being one of the theories on why Angkor was abandoned, which there are of course many. However, recent research in Angkor Wat has indicated that in the mid-17th century, Khmer people began to move back to Angkor Wat. They repaired some of the derelict buildings and even encouraged locals to move to the area. 
There are also several documents from Christian missionaries referencing Angkor Wat during this time period. It is also uncertain why shortly after this time period it was abandoned for a second time. Each of the 14 inscriptions left by Japanese pilgrims correspond to the time period of the Red Seal ships between 1612 and 1632. Therefore, it seems that each of the Japanese who wrote them were likely those who traveled aboard the ships. Some of them might have been Ronin, and others could have been Christian refugees living in Cambodia. So what did the young Morimoto write on the walls of Angkor Wat? I'll provide the full inscription here for you on the screen, but I would just like to read a little bit of it. I, Ukandaya Kazafusa, traveled thousands of miles by sea to come to this site in order to offer four Buddha images in a ritual to cleanse and purify the souls of those living and those deceased. I hereby write this inscription for the current life of prosperity of my father, Morimoto Gidayu, who lives in Akeda in northwest Seshu. I hereby write this inscription for her sake in the afterlife of my late mother, Miyoshin Daishi, from Uwadi, 20th day of the new year, 1632. Okandayu Kazafusa embarked on his journey to Cambodia in order to pursue a Buddhist practice in performing good deeds for the souls of his parents. During the time period when Tokugawa Iyasu established the shogunate, he had created a new class of warriors with limited upward mobility. As a result, many samurai were faced with few options within Japan to confront this new reality. Some of these members of the warrior class chose to become ronin or abandon their aspirations entirely, while others sought fresh starts overseas. For example, the most famous one of course being Nagamasa Yamada, who became a warrior and merchant in Ayutthaya, which was fairly typical for many men of his standing. A year after Ukandayu Kazafusa's visit to Cambodia, the shogunate would officially ban its citizens from traveling abroad. Meanwhile, the shogun would increase its persecution of Christians and in 1635 declared the death penalty for anyone traveling or returning abroad. In response, the Miramoto family concealed Ukandayu Kazafusa's history of overseas travel to avoid any accusation of Christianity. Ukandayu Kazafusa also went into hiding and seemed to have adopted an alias disappearing from the historical record, but the Miramoto family continued to serve the Hosukawa clan and remained an integral part of the shogunate. And as for the communities of Japanese people in Cambodia, like their counterpart communities elsewhere, Japan's self-isolation ended continued migration into Cambodia, and most either decided to remain in Cambodia or moved back to Japan, like Okandaya Kazafusa did. And without renewed migration, eventually most of the Japanese in Cambodia assimilated into the local culture, but continued to survive within the historical record into the present. And so ends our story of the Japanese in Cambodia. Thank you for taking the time to watch. If you haven't already, please consider hitting the like and subscribe button and let me know your thoughts in the comments. Your support means a lot and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks for watching.